Um, I think uh, we, we want to be on track to become a multi-planet species and, and a space bearing civilization in order to find out what the universe is all, all about and ensure the continuance of consciousness as we know it. I mean, people think there's aliens, but honestly, I haven't seen any sign of aliens. So as far as we know, we're the only life. Whether we could be the only life, so let's put it that way. And we need to take the set of actions that are most likely to make the future good and result in the continuance of consciousness as we know it. It's not an escape vehicle. It's, it's not like you can, I mean, unless Mars, Mars is made self-sustaining, which will probably not happen in my lifetime it's meaningless to have an escape you know a lifeboat or escape hatch or something if you're simply moving to another place where you will soon die out that doesn't count this is really about minimizing existential risk for civilization as a whole and then uh, having an exciting future that you can look forward to and a future where we are a space bearing civilization and uh, multi-planet species is far more exciting than one where we are not i mean that's an exciting future and being forever confined to earth until some eventual extinction event is depressing and not fun and uh, we need things that make you want to get out of bed in the morning and be excited about the future. And I think being a space faring civilization is one of those things that everyone get, can get excited about. I think it's helpful to have as the objective the creation of a self-sustaining city on Mars. I think this is this is, has to be the objective, not simply a few people or a base, but a self-sustaining city. The, the acid test really is if these if the ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, does Mars die out. I mean, I think this, re this really might come down to, you know, on the, the great filter front, are, are we going to create a self-sustaining city on Mars before or after World War III? And I think the probability of it being created after World War III, hopefully, the, hopefully there's never a World War III, but of, of after is low. So we should try to create, let's make the city self-sustaining before any possible World War III. This is just a risk. This is not, you know, there's some chance that we will have a giant war or a super volcano or a comet might hit the Earth. And frankly, right now, civilization is not looking super strong. You know, this is looking a little, little rickety right now, to be frank. You first have to say, what what is the goal? And once you have what is the goal, you can then measure various designs against that goal. Otherwise, you're saying, how are you evaluating? Why is one design better than another? What's your goal? It's got to be a goal. So the, the goal is get enough tonnage to Mars to, and enough people to make Mars self-sustaining as quickly as possible. So then you say, okay, let's back out the math on this. We're going to need we're gonna a lot of, need a lot of tonnage, uh, maybe 100,000 tons, maybe a million tons. So you can't be faffing around with these expandable rockets. They're a joke. They're absurd. Even Saturn V is tiny potatoes. Because if, if you want to get, like, like, let's say a million tons to the surface of Mars, inclusive of people, that, that means probably something around four or five million useful tons of payload into a low Earth orbit. Now, let's put this into perspective. Total global capacity to orbit of all expendable rockets is around five or 600 tons, I think. And, and if you said, okay, the world's going to end if you do not increase your capacity, perhaps they could do a thousand tons. Okay, so that's one five thousandth of what's needed. This is ridiculous. Experimental rockets are the, are the absolute, are just utterly stupid, in my opinion. Utterly stupid. They're a complete waste of time. People should stop wasting their time. If you try to sell an expendable plane, people would laugh you out of the room. If you try to sell an expendable car, they would laugh you out of the room. If you try to sell an expendable horse, they would laugh you out of the room and think there's something wrong with you mentally. <laughs> All these things are reusable. It's, it's essential to be reusable. Yeah, like they're, they're not really trying to do, not even trying to do reusability, which is bizarre because they make planes that are reusable. So, I mean, if they if they talk to their, if they talk to one of their customers, Viser, a, a Lockheed fighter jet or a Boeing aircraft, like, hey, we're going to sell you a 737 that can be used once. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not 737 Max. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> that was, that turns out that was a single use airplane at a time. But it really, it would be an absurd thing for them to sell a single use aircraft, but they feel quite comfortable selling a single use rocket. Now, creating a reusable rocket, orbital rocket, is very difficult. Doing a suborbital reusable rocket is easy. Doing a reusable orbital rocket is hard. Even when a lot of smart people have put a, a, quite a bit of effort into it, they might get two or three percent of the lift mass to low Earth orbit. Um, and a really epic rocket would get four. I'm not sure, ever, I don't think anyone's ever gotten four. So, but, but you basically need to have something that in expendable form would probably get about four percent of its payload to orbit, such that you can spend about half of that four percent on reusability and still net out to around two percent of payload to orbit. So you have to make both the booster and the upper stage and the fairing and everything reusable. But, but having a long, thin rocket is not very mass efficient. You end up having to have thicker skins to take out the bending moment. And then, and then having, like kerosene is, is not the right fuel. Methane is a much better fuel. You can get higher ISP, a specific impulse, basically efficiency. I mean, probably a lot of those who are listening know what the rocket equation is, but in simple terms, it's actually it's very simple. It's like a rocket is going to go further if it shoots the gas out of the end faster and if a bigger percentage of its mass is propellant. I mean, it's obvious. <laughs> so that's what, that's what the rocket equation says. So if you shoot, shoot gas out faster in, in the right direction and increase the, the percentage of propellant, that, that's going to get you, allow you to go further. 
with methane, you can shoot it out faster. <laughs> you can make it on Mars for sure. Being able to, to do in-situ profound development is, or production is very important. So you don't have to carry your return fuel with you or return fuel and oxygen. It's rockets are mostly oxygen uh, or oxidizer. And there's, there's some other subtle advantages with a oxygen methane system in that you can go to a higher percentage, a hi higher mass ratio of oxygen. So with kerosene, you'd be at about a Call it roughly two and a half to one oxygen to, to fuel mass ratio with methane you're more like three and a half to one um, and you actually want that higher mass ratio because oxygen is very dense and it's inexpensive especially on earth so you're gonna you know you have all these plants just making oxygen all day long and plankton just making oxygen you never do anything so the, the cost of oxygen is basically the cost of electricity anyway so going from falcon going from uh, you know kerosene which is basically the same as jet fuel uh, it's it, like RP1, rocket propellant grade kerosene, is just a tighter grade of jet fuel. You want to go from that to something which has where the gas shoots out faster, and that's methane, and where in situ production of propellant is easier. So that's, that's why the change from kerosene to methane. Well, it's not like I, I, we're obviously in, uh, venturing into unknown territory. So it's not as though I, I, I have all these secret dates and, I, I, and I, I'm, you know, just keeping them from people. But <laughs> these are just guesses, obviously. I'm pretty, I, I'd say I'm 80 to 90% confident that we will reach orbit with Starship next year. I think probably 50 or 60, 50% 50 confident that we'll be able to bring the ship and booster back. That's like, that's more of a dicey situation. We'll probably lose a few ships before we, we really get the atmospheric return and landing, right? Hopefully we don't lose any boosters because that's a lot of engines. Our initial booster flights will just have maybe two to four engines, not 28. <laughs> 28 slot engines. Yeah, and then I think we'll probably be in um, do it doing high volume flights. I think probably in 2022, so a couple of years from now. But I'm, I'm trying to make sure that that our rate of innovation increases. It does not decrease. This is really essential. In fact, if we do not see something close to an exponential improvement in our rate of innovation, we will not reach Mars. Like a pure linear doesn't get there. I'll be dead anyway before it gets there if it's pure linear. If it's exponential. I think we could get to Mars. We could, we could probably send an uncrewed mission there in maybe four years. You know, there's a Mars conjunction every 26 months. There's one this year, so that means in a couple of years from now, there's another one. And then four years from now, there's another one. I I, I think we've got a fighting chance of, of making the that second uh, Mars transfer window. Uh, probably two or three years. As soon as you've got overall refilling, you can, you can send significant payload to the moon. Like significant meaning, 100 tons of useful payload at a shot. We will also actually go into the atmosphere of Venus, for example, just like go into orbit and, uh, and, and um, perhaps to the upper atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is extremely dense, also quite hot. But because of that dense atmosphere, you, you could have a some sort of dirigible, you know, kind of, some kind of like, the, like things that could float on Venus that could not float on Earth in the atmosphere because of the dense atmosphere. So if you could go to Venus, Starship is is definitely a general generalized ship. It, it basically can it 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 solves for transport anywhere in the solar system where, where there is a solid surface to land. <laughs> so if you can land there, we're gonna take there. Mercury is super hot. Um, I think that we could go to Ceres or any of the asteroids, the moons of Jupiter, although be quite high radiation around there, and then out to Saturn, eventually getting out to Kaiper Belt, Earth Cloud, and that kind of thing, the outer solar system. Once you have propellant depots, you can kind of like planet hop or moon hop around the, the solar system. It's not it's not a vehicle that would enable us to go interstellar, but it's that that's a that's a that's a tough one. But it, we need to make this the, the leap of going to another planet first. If, once we are a multi-planet species, we will create a forcing function for the rapid improvement of, uh, of space flight, and we'll figure out new technologies that will ultimately allow us to go to other star systems.